Man, a lot of people are all bent out of shape over the Royals letter yesterday. My goodness, happy Wednesday morning. It is great to be here on KCMO Talk Radio. I see no problem with it. I see and all I hear is an ownership group in John Sherman and the Royals who are now down to their two locations, Jackson County and Clay County. And what I believe they are doing is laying the foundation for a move up north. That's the conclusion I kept coming to yesterday as I read and reread and then reread again John Sherman's letter to Royals fans in which he said in the next 30 days they'll have renderings for the two ballpark locations in the East Village and then, of course, in North Kansas City. And by the end of September, they will have a decision on where they ultimately want to move the team. And the line that continues to stand out to me from John Sherman in in this letter, and if you haven't read the letter from John Sherman, it's up on my uh, Twitter page, at Pete Mundo, and it's also up on the KCMO Talk Radio Facebook page. This line from John Sherman keeps sticking out to me. We're focused on playing the long game for the region we call home. Not the city. Not Kansas City. The region we call home. In fact, region was mentioned several times throughout this letter. It was not about Kansas City proper. It was about the region. And that, to me, is the owner of the team dropping these little nuggets, suggesting that, you know what? This team's gone. I I think now it is much better than 50-50 that this team is gone. Uh, Mark, you're obviously heavily ingrained in the sports scene, and we talk about this more from an economic development, political perspective, but what are the sports gurus in town, the uh, (laughs) sports lackeys, what are they they saying and opining on this? Before I dive into that, Stigall agrees with you. He read region 10 times in that one letter. They said region, and he, he talked about that at the top of the show yesterday, but yeah, the, the people in town that are just Royals fans just seem to not be interested in this story at all because of how bad the team is. <laughs> they just don't want them to spending more money on a stadium. They want them to put more money and invest it into the team. But in the long run, that's what will happen. Those people, I just don't think, understand that at this point. Well, I mean, that's the whole – that's the purpose of this, right? I mean, now, listen – Sherman's going to have to put his money where his mouth is if he moves stadiums and he gets a windfall of money off of restaurants and bars and commercial space and everything else. uh, If that happens and then the Royals are still in the bottom third of the league in payroll, (laughs) then you'll have every right to rip him and rip this ownership group, right? But, uh, you know, until they fail to do that... I don't see how you can sit here and just assume that they're going to pocket the money unless you just think every big bad billionaire is out to screw me, Mark. Yeah, and you got to think about the bad luck that Sherman has had. He took over the team in 2019 in November right before the pandemic hit. They mm-hmm. d- weren't able to have fans in the stadium in 2020. Uh, you know, they had a really good farm system with pitchers and then those guys just didn't pan out. So I mean, it's not like it's all John Sherman's fault they're terrible this year. <laughs> Uh, Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, he bought the team out of good faith, and obviously it has not worked out thus far. Of course, you know, the buck stops with him, the old cliche, and he deserves some blame. But to me, this is really not about, oh, the team sucks. I don't think they deserve a new ballpark. It's like, this is really not about whether or not the team stinks. This is about whether or not you see a future for a major league team, and there's only 30 of these in the entire nation, and Kansas City has one of those 30 whether you see economic benefits, more economic benefits out of North KC or the East Village. That's it. That's all this comes down to. Because he's moving. The K is not staying. And I'm going to be out of the K next week. Mets are in town, going to take the girls out there. I think it's a great ballpark. I agree with you when, when many of you come out and you say, hey, the K is a great stadium. I don't get it. I agree. I agree. But understand, it's pointless to have that debate and that conversation right now because they're gone. It doesn't matter. But I think for John Sherman, he's looking at these two options and saying, geez, where do I want to invest the next 30, 40 years, Clay County or Jackson County? That's a no-brainer. 
And then on top of that, where is he more likely to get a sales tax passed? In Clay or in Jackson? And you know what? I think right now there's a lot of people in Jackson County because remember, these votes oftentimes do become emotional. Is the team good? That impacts how people vote. And in Jackson County, there's a lot of people in Eastern Jack, and we have a lot of you listeners in Eastern Jackson County who are like, you know, I like the K. If they go downtown, I ain't going, and I'm not voting for more of my sales tax dollars to go to a stadium downtown. Whereas if it goes to Clay County, that will be such a boost for Clay County, for North KC, and let's not kid ourselves here because we've heard this from many of you, and we can hear it again at 913-408-7710. There are many of you who would be of the opinion that you'd like to stick it to Kansas City. You'd like to stick it to Jackson County, to Quinton Lucas, to Frank White. It's okay. I mean, that's, that's an emotional part of voting as well. You're allowed to admit that. And you know what? That's something that if John Sherman and the Royals are smart, they're thinking about. They're thinking about the possibility of having to get sales tax money from one of our area counties and what is more likely. Jackson, where a lot of Eastern Jack will say, screw this. And by the way, a lot of the urban core might also say, screw this, because it's not going to be where some of them wanted it to be in the 18th and Vine area. They're going to perceive this to just be, well, this is just downtown for the rich and the glitzy and all the other stuff. They're going to vote against it potentially. But you go up to Clay, you go up to North KC, that's a completely different conversation. Where those folks up there, where many of you in Clay County could come out and say, you know what, this is great. This is is awesome. I love this. We get to stick it to Jackson County, stick it to Kansas City. Quentin Lucas, Frank White, we get the Major League team up here. Now the question, of course, is what's going to cost you? Well, we don't know yet, but Jerry Nolte, Clay County Commissioner, did tell Fox 4 yesterday that it could be up to a 40-year sales tax. Now, right now, in Jackson County, there's a 30-year sales or Actually, it's 25-year sales tax of three-eighths of a cent. But in Clay, because there's less people, you can either go with a higher sales tax. You could do like half a cent for 25, 30 years, or you could do three-eighths of a cent for 35 or 40 years. That's about how the math would work. So do you want a lower sales tax over a longer period of time? Or do you say, you know what, I'll take a bigger sales tax over a shorter period of time? It's probably easier politically to get the smaller sales tax over a longer period of time. Because let's be honest, I mean, with the transient nature of the American people, how many folks are going to be around in 40 years when the sales tax is still going on? I mean, I don't mean alive around, although that's worthy of conversation as well. There's a lot of folks who won't be around in 40 years. But I mean more from the standpoint of even if you are going to be around, are you going to be in Clay County? Eh, not your problem, right? Pass it, get the team up there and vote for it. So there is a lot of moving parts in this conversation, and there's a lot of unhappy people south of the river. But I genuinely believe if the Royals go north, it's the best thing for the entire region. Jackson County would extend its sales tax, the 3 8 cent. That'll go all to the Chiefs. The Chiefs get to own the complex, the Truman Sports Complex, and do what they want out there, renovate Arrowhead, and then you spread the wealth, so to speak. Royals go up north. That's on Clay County, and I think the entire region wins. I do. I think it's a great win for the entire region in that scenario, and I know that, you know, Kansas City City leadership is going to poo-poo the Royals going up north. It's fine. We got the Chiefs. They're going to do a very much about face here in the near future. But when we're talking region, Kansas City region at large, a lot of good, a lot of good that can come out of this. 913-408-7710 as we get it rolling on a Wednesday morning. Pete Mundo, 614. It's great to be with you here on KCMO Talk Radio. And we do have to get to... A very interesting conversation at the bottom of the hour. Uh, voting. I've been a long time proponent of changing how and who can vote and why. And we actually have a presidential candidate who is voicing those same opinions. We'll get to that bottom of the hour and you as well. Pete Mundo on KCMO. See, I can already see it. A lot of you on the uh, text line here, 913 408 are more 
more than happy to take the Royals away from Jackson County. I mean, and not because, like, you're getting a winning team. You're not. They're – what do they mark? Is there – I mean, the record's been worst or second worst in baseball over the last uh, – couple of months really since the season started are, are, do you know are they did have the A's passed them for the worst record in Major League Baseball yet do we know that yeah they were right about together around the all-star break and I think the A's have been even worse so I think oh, the, I think the A's are the worst team right now and the Royals are second worst okay and all right all right well that's that's been kind of how it's been all season long right I mean that's just that's that's what the season has been but a lot of you are saying, "Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look up north. I, I, I have to prove this." For a lot of you, it seems like it's a way to stick it to Jackson County. I mean, that's the emotional side of this. That if you're John Sherman, you'd be foolish to not consider. Now, I love when someone on the text line gives me an article to reference to use, and now I'm changing the direction of this segment. But I'm going to weave it into the Royals thing here as John Sherman put out this letter yesterday where he said, hey, in the next 30 days, we'll have renderings of the two site locations, downtown KC and North KC. We'll have a decision on our future location by the end of uh, September. How about this? KC TV 5, yesterday evening. Headline, city bus drivers tired of violence while on the job raise safety concerns. Some Kansas City bus drivers are complaining that their safety is at risk and that turnover will continue if their safety concerns are not addressed. Bus operators said they've been putting their lives on the line after experiencing one too many acts of violence while out on the job. Well, geez, this coincides awfully well with Kansas City, as of late 2019, becoming the first major U.S. city to approve Fair, free, public transit. It's almost like just allowing people on your buses, vagrants, homeless, whoever, on your bus because they feel like it, because they want something to do, because they need a place to go, isn't in the best interest of your actual customers who need to use mass transit and your city employees who are bus drivers. The latest great failure, and I hate to put it this way, but Fair free transit is a failure. And the only reason, let's remember, the only reason Kansas City has fair free transit on buses is because they made the streetcar free. Why did they make the streetcar free? Because they wanted people to ride it. They wanted to act like people actually were going to get on the streetcar when it's nothing but a trolley ride around town for tourists and for people who are maybe visiting the downtown area and think it's cool to get on a streetcar for seven minutes. That's all it is. But the perception was, geez, you have wealthier people downtown getting free mass transit, air quotes. Of course, there's no free lunch, but free mass transit. Yet you've got poorer people in other parts of Kansas City paying for a bus fare. What gives? Well, the smart thing to do would have been, hey, let's start charging for the streetcar. But if they did that, nobody would ride it. If they made you pay for the streetcar, first off, you'd have to change the whole system. You'd have to figure out how to do tickets and everything else. And you'd have less riders. And then the apparent success of the streetcar would not be there. They wouldn't be able to do what they're doing now, which is extend it if they force people to pay for that thing. So then they say, okay, well, that's a good point. We shouldn't have poor people paying for bus rides when we've got wealthier people not paying for streetcars, vanity streetcars. So they go fare free transit. And now, in a story that's not got nearly enough coverage, finally, credit to KCTV5, they've got bus operators saying that they're putting their lives on the line. And I'll tell you right now, they're not putting their lives on the line because some guy gets on the bus after a long day of work and he's pissed off and he starts swinging a bat at bus drivers. No, it's because it's fare free and any Tom, Dick, and Harry can walk on that bus and do whatever the heck they want. And there's nothing a driver can do about it. Nothing whatsoever. So, I mean, you combine this with the rise in crime, with the policies that continue to be just a debacle with the most progressive city council in Kansas City history set to begin here coming up in August. 
And if you're John Sherman, what are you going to do? You're really going to get in bed with this city right now with these problems, right? I, I don't think so. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Goodness gracious. So thank you on the text line for sharing this article. City bus drivers tired of violence while on the job are raising safety concerns. Can you blame them one bit? The article goes on the note. So far in 2023, the number of assaults on bus operators sits at nine. Five of those have been physical strikes. Wow. Now, of course, you've got the people who are involved with the KCATA, and they're like, ah, you know, that's no big deal. We're talking about nine contacts and five strikes over millions of rides. Oh, come on. What are you guys complaining about? You think that bus operators in this town are going to the media, and the media in this town that is overwhelmingly to the left is really going to overstate this story? You think that they they want fair, free transit to be a failure? They want it to be a massive success, generally speaking. And they're calling out fair, free transit for what it is. A terrible idea, a disservice to good, hardworking people who just want to get on a bus and feel safe and not deal with smelly, homeless vagrants rolling on the bus because they got nothing else to do. That's what it's supposed to be about. That's who it's supposed to be for. I mean, even New York City hasn't done this because they know what a debacle it would be. And that's the city with the most managed transit of the country. 913-408-7710. Coming up, which presidential candidate has the best idea for voting I've heard in a long time? We'll tell you who and that idea next. Well, it's about damn time somebody was able to put into concise, easy words what this country really is and why it makes sense for us to go in a different direction when it comes to how we vote in this country. Happy Wednesday. It is good to be here on KCMO Talk Radio. So, uh, by the way, stay cool the rest of the week. You ready for the heat wave, Mark? You feeling good about this? You ready? Did you mow the lawn? You get that done before the heat wave comes in? Yeah, I did that over the weekend. It's it's going to be a little bit rough out there. Probably go to the pool at some point this week. <laughs> All right. Mark, look for Mark in his uh, Speedo at the pool. He's going to look good out there this weekend. He's going to be sweating, dripping sweat. Uh, Such a nice man. Thank you very much. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, you, will, you will look great at the pool, Mark. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, I don't know if he's going to look great at the pool, but seems like a slender guy running for president, of course, as a Republican, uh, a, a tech. I don't think he's not a billionaire, but he's certainly a man. He's 37, 38 years old. He has made hundreds of millions of dollars in the tech space, uh, and he is now running for president. And he's running this very grassroots campaign, and he's an interesting guy. He's a really smart guy, and he's just different. He's been willing to talk to anybody, anyone, anywhere, anytime. Uh, you know, he's, he's not going to be the nominee, but he's certainly made a name for himself. And he's been hustling. He's been all over Iowa. And he's actually rising in the polls. Now, he's like third or fourth, depending on the poll that you look at. But he's just a really interesting guy. And he shared this video clip of him talking to some voters in Iowa um, on his social media channel yesterday afternoon. And first, I want to share with you what he said about what this country at its core really is that not enough people, frankly, know or talk about. Here it is from yesterday as he's talking to a voter. That's the extreme departure from a constitutional republic. So thank you for understanding that. And you are the only candidate that talks about a constitutional republic. That's what we are, though. I know. That's what we are. And that means we have duties in our direct democracy. have lost sight of the constitution. It is a constitutional republic. And that's the only way back. And it is the single greatest source of freedom in human history. I know. And we will not apologize for it. All right, Uh, that is very well said by Vivek Ramaswamy. But then he also went on to say something about the voting age in this country and uh, how we could go about changing the voting age in a smart way, 
not in a way that's biased against the youth, but in a smart way in this country. I want to get your thoughts on Vivek Ramaswamy. Let's roll the clip. You have the guts to bring up issues like the voting age. Your idea, I loved how you phrased it. I'm totally on board with it. Thank you. And I've heard people say he shot himself in the foot with that. I said, with, the, with say, the young Republicans, I said, did they listen to him? There's not one of those young Republicans that would have a problem at all with passing an exam. A civic test, exactly. So it's like if, yeah. if, if they were turned off by that, then they didn't listen. That's, and and in my view is persuasion. I mean, I don't say things just because it's going to initially, you know, poll well and check the box. I that's say my beliefs, see, and I believe in persuasion. But that's what I... That's what I admire because I don't believe people are being honest unless they tell me something that I might not want to hear. Exactly. Thank you for. So that was Vivek Ramaswamy talking to an Iowa voter. What is his idea? Vivek Ramaswamy has suggested a constitutional amendment to raise the voting age from 18 to 25. However, still allowing 18 year olds to vote. If they either pass the same civics test required of immigrants to become naturalized citizens or else perform six months of military or first responder service. I mean, what's the argument against that? Like 913-408-7710. I love this idea from Vivek Ramaswamy. You can vote if you're 18. You just have to either pass the same civics test required of immigrants to become naturalized citizens, or, of course, if you serve this country, military or first responder, you can also then, of course, vote at the age of 18. Like, tell me, if you want to get a country that is well-informed, that understands the basics, now, in a perfect world, I would love to see everybody pass the same civics test that we require of immigrants to America to become naturalized citizens in order to vote. I I mean, I would love to see that. But of course, that's not likely to happen. But if you do it for young people, it sets the tone for, theoretically, the rest of their adult lives, where at least they have the basics if they want to vote. Or they can just wait till they're 25. And frankly, If you are somebody who doesn't think you can or isn't willing to pass a basic civics test at 18 to then go have your civic duty to go vote, like, if that's not important to you, right, if you're not a military service member and that's just not important to you, then why why would we just, well, you're an American, you were lucky to be born in this country, therefore you can vote. Why? Why is there not some standard? Now, I'm not expecting... Vivek Ramaswamy to be the GOP nominee and swoop in and become the president and get this thing done. But I I really respect this conversation starting in a smart way, in a nuanced way, where you say, okay, 18 years old, you serve the country, you can vote. And if not, you can pass a civics test, the same civics test we ask of every immigrant coming to America. You know, I... uh, was getting lunch with a guy a couple of weeks ago, and he's been doing some pro bono work for folks who have come to this country and are working to be American citizens. And he told me this great story about this Afghan family who came in after the chaos of 2021. When everybody was fleeing, they came in as refugees, and they're working very hard to be naturalized American citizens. And he's telling me the story, and he was saying that they recently took their, their test. They took their test to become citizens of this country. And he told me that they were so proud to take this test. He said they aced this test. They are so proud to be Americans, to become naturalized citizens. Uh, they love taking the civics test. And he told me they live out in Raytown. It's an Afghan family. They knew no English when they came over here. And they are the only ones on their street in Raytown that have an American flag outside their house. When he was telling me the story, I was like getting choked up. I'm like, that's the American dream. 
those are the kind of people that we want to come in and love America. I don't care where they came from. I don't care what they look like. I just want them to come here and love America like you and I. And part of it is the fact that he believes they came here, they wanted to be here. Now, they miss, of course, friends and family back home. They're still trying to figure out, you know, the American way, so to speak. But they pass their civics test with flying colors. And they probably know more now than, I don't know what the percentage would be, but a large percentage of American-born high school students in this country. And they're Afghan refugees who have been in America for 18 months. Think about that. Yet we spend billions and billions of billions of dollars on our public education system. And how likely do you think it is that a group of Afghans who have been here for 18 months are more equipped on civics in this country than American-born citizens who have been in public schools K-12? through That's sad. But it's a very powerful story. 913-408-7710. Let's uh, start with Fernando in KCK. Fernando, good morning. You're on KCMO. Oh, well, wow. that's awesome. Hey, so since you guys are going to raise, or not you guys, uh, you know, they're planning on raising the age limit for, you know, to 25, so to speak. Should we limit the age to 55, you know, when people start retiring, to, unless they served or can pass the civics test as well? That's interesting, Fernando. I mean, I, I, I've often said I would put an age limit on becoming president. Um, oh, I agree. <laughs> I, I would definitely do that. I would put an age limit on serving in public office. Uh, I don't know if I'd make it 80, somewhere around there. Um, would I put an age yeah. limit on voting? I, no, because my thought there is you've been around the block, you've been a citizen, you've paid your taxes for decades, theoretically in this country, I wouldn't put a limit on voting. But until we understand, until we make sure that we have a population, since the public schools are not doing it, that just understand the basics of this country, I think that's what makes it different when you talk about the voting age on the younger end. I understand, but I mean, sometimes when you're, you know, past your age, you know, not name dropping president, but you know, you should also be able to know who you're voting for. Yeah, you know, he, Fernando. In my, if I was king, and thanks for the call. If I was king, I would have a civics test that you renew like a driver's license, where every whatever you want to make it five, ten years, you would have to pass this test to renew your right to vote. That's what I would do if I was king. Vivek Ramaswamy, who's running for president, all he suggested, he was up in Iowa, and he suggested this yesterday to a voter, that he would have a constitutional amendment to raise the voting age from 18 to 25, but still allow 18-year-olds to vote if they either pass the same civics test required of immigrants to become naturalized citizens, or else perform six months of military or first responder service. 913-408-7710. We'll continue this conversation with you. I know a lot of you want to chime in. We'll do this coming up next. Pete Mundo on KCMO. Vivek Ramaswamy, he's making some headway in the uh, Republican race to be the GOP nominee in 2024. I don't think he's going to be the guy, but I think he's an important voice. He's been able to articulate some quality ideas and thoughts in easily digestible manners. And I really appreciate that about him. And he had this one yesterday. He was up in Iowa, and he was talking to a voter, and he is suggesting and proposing a constitutional amendment to raise the voting age from 18 to 25, but to still allow 18-year-olds to vote if they either pass the same civics test required of immigrants to become naturalized citizens or else to perform six months of military or first responder service. I would love that idea. I'm not projecting that if Vivek Ramaswamy somehow pulls a rabbit out of a hat, becomes the nominee, um, you know, wins the election, that this is going to happen. But I think this conversation needs to happen. And it's just the start of the conversation, but I do really believe in this conversation taking place and the importance of this conversation happening. 
seven seven ten. Let's go to Jim. He is uh, out east. Jim, good morning. You're on KCMO. Yeah, good morning, Pete. I, I got a little bit of a problem with what you've already stated because voting is a right; it's not a privilege. So you can't treat it that way because we already have that. I I think we ought to have the civics as a requirement to get a graduation from high school or the GED. So you think that's the way around it from the stamp? But, but here, let me let me ask you this then. Why do we make it – I know the age of 18 is when you're legally an adult, right? But we don't let Correct. you uh, do a lot of things until 21, until 25. If we're in this world now where, where people are living in Never Never Land or, and they want to be Peter Pan forever, why don't we just say, hey, the age is now at least 21. Maybe 25 is too aggressive, but at least it's 21. Well, you start adding requirements. Then you start saying, well, okay, let's just change that to where you meet a minimum – of uh, the uh, income, that you can't be welfare, you know, things like that. You start adding requirements to a right. Kings and, you know, monarchies do that to eliminate, you know, people from voting that they, the way they didn't want it to go. If you leave it as it is, but you educate prior to with the civics test, then you have a better educated base. Jim, I like that. Um, in a perfect world, I would agree with that. And I, you know, if you told me, thanks, Jim, if you told me that we could create a public school system that would require every student before they get their GED to pass a civics test, uh, that would certainly be a way around this. I feel much better about the future. I'll tell you that right now. Could you imagine the uproar, by the way? If, let's say, Trump becomes the president again, or whoever, and uh, they somehow get it passed that, you know, public schools, Department of Education gets this through, you've got to pass a civics test to get your GED. Could you imagine the uproar from the left? And by the way, there would be no reason for it. It would be the most reasonable thing, which should be the most uh, mundane a non-controversial thing that Trump could possibly do or any Republican president could possibly do. Hey, the Department of Education is going to require you to pass a civics test just like every immigrant does to this country before you get your GED. There would be uproar. It's like, hey, I'm too busy teaching people that they can be seven different genders and identify as they them. I don't have time to teach them civics. What are you talking about? Stu's in Rosedale. What's up, Stu? You're on KCMO. Good morning. Hey, Mongo. Well, yeah, your caller, Jim, had it right. And, I mean, uh, I'm old enough, you know, I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I learned this stuff in the third, fourth, and fifth grade. And it's not being taught anymore. Just as, you know, you just got done saying, if I was king. Well, Mungo, if I were king, I would bring back not only teaching civics, but teaching proper English and the subjunctive case. You know, so we'd have a little more respect for our language as well as our system of government. But I've advocated an idea like this for years because my idea was just that, you know, we just got done with uh, 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 Independence Day, which for many people is merely the 4th of July or Firecracker Day. And uh, uh, I've advocated that if you're going to buy fireworks, it ought to be accompanied by a copy of the Constitution or the Bill of Rights because people have no idea what they're even celebrating on that day. They have no clue. And you can stop people on the street and ask who we fight for our independence from, and they say, uh, Mexico? You know, they don't have a clue. We that need, is true. They don't. The, the bottom line, the real bottom line, Mungo, is we need a purge of the educational establishment. Yeah. Thank you, Stuart. Have a great day. Appreciate that. Uh, we've got the language police as well, alive and well here on KCMO Talk Radio on a Wednesday morning. So uh, I will watch. Mark, I might need you to break out the old civility bell if, uh, you know, the language police are looking to get on me today. Fair enough. All right. Got it. I need you on the top of your game there, Mark, with the civility bell, just uh, just in case. I don't want to offend anybody. I, I would not want to use um, any incorrect language 
as somebody who speaks for four hours a day and 20 hours a week. I would not want to use the wrong word. That, thank, that, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, you're on it. You're on it, Mark. You're, I, I knew you would be on it. I knew you'd be willing to pick up the task at hand. So good job by you. It's going to be a heavy lift these next three hours because you never know what word I might say that might be slightly incorrectly used or out of context. You just never know. What are we talking about? Yeah, exactly right. I wish I could be as well-spoken as that guy right there. (laughs) Unbelievable. Oh, gosh. Well, hey, I just think it's a valuable conversation to have. And I think that, you know, whether it's Jim Stu, there's been some good points here throughout the morning. But I am still very much open to Vivek Ramaswamy's idea of raising the voting age. I, I, I know some of you don't like it, but you know what? Can't get anybody to know what the heck this country was founded based on and all about. Something's got to give. Coming up on KCMO Talk Radio, we are going to get to uh, the latest awful idea on why we are accepting unhealthy people in this country. That's coming up next. Well, it's a uh, good day to be in Kansas City, a hot day, but a great day to be in Kansas City because, well, if you're a Chiefs fan, I just got to note this real quick before I get to my next topic. Justin Herbert, the Chargers quarterback, just became the NFL's highest paid player. (laughs) Five-year deal, 262 and a half. Don't leave out the half, Mark. 262 and a half million (laughs) Dollars, $133.7 million guaranteed. See, I love this, Mark, because you've got teams in the Chiefs division paying more for their quarterbacks than the Chiefs are paying for Patrick Mahomes, <laughs> who's the best quarterback in the division. So this is a good thing for the Chiefs, is it not? Because it means that the Chargers can now have to spend or are going to have to spend less money on the other position groups. Oh, yeah, this is a net win for the Chiefs. I mean, Herbert, don't get me wrong, Herbert is a great quarterback. He's a top 10 quarterback, but he's not number one in his own division. So, yeah, that's great for the Chiefs. Uh, that, I love this. And, by the way, Joe Burrow, who I believe is going to get a deal this offseason. Is that right, Mark, or is that next offseason Burrow will get his deal? He can get it this offseason. I don't know if they're going to get Wait or not, but, uh, you know, technically, I guess maybe the Chargers did get a better deal for Herbert now the next offseason because the number just keeps going up. But, I mean, yeah, mm-hmm. her, her, I, the, Joe Burrow is going to get an even higher number. So He is. So Lamar Jackson, previously the quarterback for the Ravens, got $52 million per season. Herbert got $52.5 million on his deal. So if you're Joe Burrow, you got to go for 53, right? You got to go for fifty three mil. I mean, he's been the two AFC Championship games in a Super Bowl. Oh yeah, yeah. And and Mahomes obviously could earn up to sixty million if he wanted it, but he's like, you know what? I'm making almost a billion dollars off the field, so I don't need that right yeah. now. <laughs> no, but here's where Patrick Mahomes is so damn smart, and he just gets it, man. Like he's better off making forty million on the field per year. He's in the forty to forty five range allowing the team to spend money elsewhere, which lets him compete for more Super Bowls, which leads to, as you noted, hundreds of millions of dollars in more endorsements by being a Super Bowl contending every year quarterback that then makes up for the 10 or $15 million extra that he's not making on the field. It not only makes up for it, it makes up for it many times over with the endorsement money. Oh yeah, and I'm I'm in, I'm so impressed by his investment skills too. I mean, whoever his yes. investment advisor is is a genius. <laughs> you know, and it's it, it, but that's why you know it does say something when you have a, a young man whose father played professional sports. I don't think you need that necessarily to have this kind of savviness and foresight, but it doesn't hurt when your dad was a pro athlete, which Mahomes' dad was, of course. You do have, I think, some of this perspective that you might not have when you're like, I need my bag. I got to make the most money possible. My agents are pressuring me to, you know, because the agents, they just want the best deal because that helps all their other clients as well. All the agents care about are themselves. That's it. They want their guys to make the most money possible on the field because it helps them, obviously, and it helps their other and future clients. Mahomes is like, no, I got a plan here. And the plan's working to perfection. So have fun with that, Chargers. We'll beat you twice this year. It'll probably be close because the Chiefs and Chargers always play close games. But Uh you pay your quarterback $52.5 million and have fun with that, Mark. It's all yours.
Oh yeah, yeah. That's 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 basically. That, I can't say better than that, Pete. You got it. <laughs> oh, all right, I got it, Mark. Very good. Now I've got to bring Mark into this next conversation as well. Uh, the headline here is from the Observer, and the headline reads as follows: What if we let our kids eat what they want? A radical new take on the weight debates. Well, uh, in the story is by this lady, Rebecca Seal, and um, it goes on to talk about Virginia Soul Smith, the author of a new book that is called Fat Talk, Coming of Age in Diet Culture. And it goes on to propose the idea that we just let our kids eat whatever they want. Now, Mark, your girls are older than mine, but if you allowed your girls to eat just whatever they want, what would they be eating all day? Oh, it would just, I mean, the the chips would be, got, I mean, we try not to stock <laughs> chips because of this reason, but yeah, th- there would be no chips left in the house. Uh, the uh, the marshmallows that we get for s'mores every now and then, they would just be eating the marshmallows hand and fist by themselves. <laughs> uh, you know, chocolate syrup, you know, would be drank like milk. You know, that, that's what would be happening in our house. It'd be like that scene in Heavyweights. I don't know if you've seen that movie or not. But yes, yes. <laughs> they're yes. just indulging out in the field, just going crazy. <laughs> that sounds about right. That's Now, in my house, it would be a combination of uh, cookies and uh, popcorn and goldfish. Uh, I'm trying to think what else I'm missing from the list. But none of it would be healthy. <laughs> Cheez-Its, yes. French fries. I mean, it's amazing. We go to Chick-fil-A with the kids. And the girls, uh, you know, we'll get them the the chicken uh, nuggets, and it's like, hey, girls, you can't just eat the French fries. You got to actually eat the chicken. That's like the semi healthy part of this meal. Um, so, you know, they'd be firing up the French fries every day. I mean, you know, it, it'd be ridiculous. It, it'd be out of control. But this author is advocating for trusting children to choose what they eat, allowing them to live by their likes and dislikes to choose when they've had enough, and to say no when they want to, so that they learn to know themselves and their bodies. This is the dumbest, wokest idea I've ever seen. Anybody who has actually raised young children knows that there is nothing practical about this. And it's part of a broader point. It's not just about this being an incredibly dumb idea, right? It's about this broader point that we're getting from media. Remember the story we did oh, two weeks ago where MSNBC was calling it far right to exercise and work out and that gyms are littered with far right neo-Nazi people who are trying to prepare for some coming race war or something insane like that. And then it ties back to COVID when they shut down gyms and said, you know what you got to do? Don't exercise. Don't get yourself in shape to combat COVID, which, you know, it turned out in hindsight, the better shape you were in, the healthier you were the less likely COVID was going to impact you in a serious way instead of, you know, suggesting, hey, this is a great chance to get this country in the shape. Instead, we said, let's shut down the gyms. Let's lock up basketball hoops outside. Let's close down parks for kids. Go hide in your basement, watch video game, watch TV, play video games, and we'll send you a check and put on the COVID-15 while you're at it to become less healthy. That's what we encouraged. And it's this, it's this continuing conversation, this continuing push in this country to do two things. One, make us less healthy, and two, treat children like adults. People want to do it when it comes to picking genders at seven, eight years old. Now they want to do it on allowing kids to decide whatever they want to eat, when they want to eat. I mean, who, what, you're a parent, I'm a parent, Mark's a parent. Who possibly thinks it's a good idea to just allow children to live by their every whim? Their brains are not developed. That's the point. But once again, if you want to push this idea that we're all just human beings, there's no children, adult, parent, child, we're all just human beings living in this society together, and... We're all essentially treated as equals. doesn't matter if you're 7, 17, 27, 87. You're a human being, and you can do what you want to do. And if you want to live a life of glutton, whether you're 7 or 77, well, you should be able to do that. 
and you should be able to decide for yourself the bizarre social construct that many are trying to create, this fits right into that idea. That somehow we should be allowing children to pick what they're eating? I mean, my, I, I, I've got a four-year-old who can't even pick out clothes for preschool without sometimes making three different changes. Now, I don't know because I'm not here during the week, but I see it on the weekends and the mornings. It's like, hey, let's go to Home Depot. All right, we need three uh, costume changes, for lack of a better word, before we actually make that trip and go into Home Depot. Kids don't even remember to brush their teeth. <laughs> but we should let them pick, Mark, what they're eating three meals a day because, well, that's a good way to figure out, for them to figure out who they are and what their bodies are about. They're children. They don't know anything, Mark. That's the point of being a child. You need guidance from parents. Yeah, my youngest just wants to wear her swimming suit everywhere in the summer. I'm like, no, we have to actually wear clothes <laughs> yeah. if we're going to hy or wherever we're going for the day. Sorry. <laughs> We got. And what is, what is she? Seven, eight. <laughs> She's seven. She's gonna be eight actually this Saturday. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm like, yeah, we're we're not eating marshmallows for dinner. Sorry, honey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've got a four year old that wants to wear an Elsa dress everywhere we go. It's like we can't wear the Elsa dress to church on Sunday, honey. We just can't do it. <laughs> um, on the text line, Pete, my son would eat his weight in pizza. I, yeah, you know what? That's what I would have been doing. Yeah, in college, That's I might have done that a time or two. <laughs> exactly. 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 So ask yourself why, whether it's picking your gender as a child, right? Not as an adult, as a child, whether it's doing that as a child, whether it's this ridiculous idea of allowing kids to just eat whatever they want with, uh, you know, no consequences. Uh, they call it a radical new take in this article. And I'll share this article, by the way, on, um, Facebook and Twitter so you can see it for yourself. To me, it's part of a broader movement. And the broader movement is about suggesting and allowing kids to not be kids and to not look at them as children who need guidance from parents. Instead, just looking at them as human beings who, just like you and I as adults, can decide whatever they want to be, however they want to be it, can eat whatever they want, can be whatever gender they want, any of that stuff goes. And that's not how anybody who's actually been a parent knows the world works. 913-408-7710. Had some good stuff on this on the text line. We'll get to more with you on uh, this as we approach 716 on a Wednesday morning. Pete Mundo on KCMO. Well, you just heard there from uh, Big Bad Bill O'Reilly. Hunter is heading to court today. He is expected to... Uh, accept that plea deal, finalize that plea deal. So we're watching that here uh, on our friends Fox News, of course. They're covering that. They're carrying that. We'll hear the latest at the bottom of the hour in their news break on KCMO Talk Radio. Uh, And by the way, not to reset hanging out with Bill O'Reilly this past Friday for another summer, but Bill is convinced. Bill has said this for a long time. He does believe that there will be somebody else at the top of the ticket in the Democratic Party in 2024. It will not be Joe Biden. And it won't just be because of the Hunter-Joe connection, what Joe knew regarding the millions of dollars the family was making off of Joe's name, but it's also going to be the cognitive issues. It will be basically a blend of both, where potentially somebody like Barack Obama says, hey, we're pulling the plug. Time's up. So let me give you one. Uh, I always get a kick, and I always like reading these to you. One good, one bad take from the readers of the Kansas City Star. You know, they do the letters to the editor from the readers. And, you know, overwhelmingly, they're just ridiculous because, let's be honest, if you're reading and writing to the Kansas City Star, what's that say about you in 23? But uh, there was one good, one bad. Since I'm in a good mood, I want to give you one good, one bad. The one good letter here I found, and it's hard to find a good one in the letter to the editor from the start. One good one came from Joe in Overland Park. And Joe is complaining, and I can't blame him one bit, about the 69 Express project. He writes here, what are Overland Park and the state thinking with the 69 Express project to widen US 69? They'd be better off closing it for the safety of the public and the workers. The pattern changes daily. 
The off and on ramps are short. The lanes are narrower than Ward Parkways. It's a danger to all drivers. All this for toll lanes? They should have shut down the highway for safety, sped up construction at least. I don't know how realistic that would have been, but I got to give Joe this much. You drive on 69, especially going south. It is just a mess. I mean, it is like we'll go on there sometimes as a family, and I feel like I'm a NASCAR driving down 69 Highway these days. With the construction cones, the weaving, I mean, it is just completely out of control. And I get it. They want to add the toll lane. Fine. Uh, Not a fan of it. But (laughs) they got to do a better job on that because it is, I mean, the weaving. Gosh, it's like driving a NASCAR race. Now, the worst article, and this is saying something from the Kansas City Star, letter to the editor. This is on student loans, student loan bailouts. And this comes from Hunter in Wichita. They went all the way to Wichita to get this nonsense. Hunter in Wichita writes, I'm tired of people being unable to put themselves in someone else's shoes. If you are lucky enough to pay off your student loans, count your blessings, writes Hunter. Oh, shut up, Hunter. How about the idea that people actually, you know, studied something that got them a job that allowed them to pay off their student loans? I, you know, there's a novel concept, Hunter. Jeez, you were lucky enough, as if it's luck that you paid off your student loans. Hey, Hunter, have you heard of hard work? Have you heard of, uh, you know, the concept of building a career to pay back money that you willingly took out? My, I mean, when I saw that first line, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. He writes, goes on the right, my very first day at university, I was told that working while going to school was bad for academics and that we should rely on student loans and our parents to get through college. I did a decent job of minimizing the amount I took out until graduate school. Okay, so you doubled down on stupid by going to graduate school. I can't help you, brother. I can't. He ends his commentary, why would anyone want someone to suffer because you got yours? They didn't get theirs. They paid it back, chief. Goodness, come on, Hunter. Jeez. You can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. There's your one good, one bad from the Kansas City Star. Pete Mundo on KCMO Talk Radio. It's good to be here on a Wednesday morning.